my name is Chris Howe. I'm the Director of Studies in Preclinical Medicine. So as to say, I'm the, uh, the person who has overall responsibility for monitoring your, your progress in the preclinical course. Um, and also I teach the first year students directly in the, the molecules in medical science course, because I'm, I'm a biochemist, I'm a professor in the biochemistry department. Um, so I see everybody in the first year to, to teach, um, teach that subject. We have a number of uh, fellows in the college who, who uh, teach the medics at different stages. Um, so we've got Ewan, who's going to talk to you shortly. Um, and we've also got Hugh Robinson, uh, who's a physiologist, Sam Bejati, who's a clinician and specializes in um, cancer, childhood cancers. And uh, we've also got Philip Bearcroft, um, who's a radiographer, and um, Alexis Ioannides, uh, who's a neurosurgeon. And Alexis is going to be talking to you a little bit later on today. So um, we've, we've got a good team of people looking after the medics in the college at the preclinical and at the, the clinical level. And um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to one of that team who is Ewan, and he's going to talk to us about pain and lessons from the naked mole rat. Ewan, over to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, so yes, welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to be talking to you uh, for approximately 40 minutes. So we're meant to finish this, seven, 11, meant to finish this session at 11.15. We'll see how things go. Well, there'll be plenty of time for Q&A at the end. Um, and then I'll make sure we've definitely stopped before the session at 11.30. Um, so, Will, if you can stop sharing your screen and then I will share mine. Okay, so... What you're looking at now are my naked mole rats running around uh, their cages and we'll talk a bit more about how one looks after naked mole rats and why these are particularly interesting uh, animals to be studying for biomedical sciences as we go through the talk. Um, but we need to understand something about pain before we can talk about the naked mole rat itself. So what is pain? Well, it's defined as an unpleasant emotion, sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Now that sound, might sound a bit of a complex way of putting things, but pain is complicated. There's the sensory ouch part, but also there is the emotional part. We'll come on to that a bit later on. Essentially, people who are living with chronic pain quite often experience negative emotional experiences. So anxiety and depression are quite common in those experiencing chronic pain. We need this part in there about resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage to take into account people who are unable to communicate. Or if you've got a traumatic injury, such as an amputation, you may have phantom limb pain. So there's no actual damage there in a hand that you've no longer got, but you may still report pain within that. So pain is a complex sensory and emotional being. And we need to contrast that with another word, which is nociception, the neural process of encoding noxious stimuli. So this is really talking about how a nerve gets switched on to send a signal that makes you go ouch and behave accordingly. And in my lab, we primarily work with rodents, with mice and naked mole rats, although we do also work with humans. And the biggest difference between a naked mole rat and a human is you can ask the human how are you feeling today and they'll give you an answer you can ask them about their pain how that feels what effect it's having on their life we can't do that with a naked mole rat we can measure all sorts of things but they can't communicate with us directly and therefore we can only infer what they might be feeling so we tend to use the words nociception and pain independently um, but also overlapping so i will quite often talk about pain in naked mole rats, whereas really what I've been measuring is nociception, because I've measured a nervous response to something, perhaps a noxious heat stimulus or a chemical, and I'm inferring that because of the response I've measured, that that will elicit a sensation of pain. But I've no real idea of knowing what the uh, animal's emotional experience is. So if we look at nociception, that neural process of encoding noxious stimuli, um, Darwin, as usual, said something very sensible when he said, any variation, however slight, if it be in any degree profitable to an individual of any species will tend to the preservation of that individual. And what we're looking at here are all sorts of species, all the way from sponges through to mammals. We've got Homo sapiens over here, and we're roughly looking at evolutionary time progressing across to the right. And nociception, that ability to detect noxious stimuli, things that might damage you, we find is conserved amongst all animals which have a nervous system. So here we've got Cielagans, an nematode worm. Most of these are hermaphrodites with 302 neurons, 24 of which are nociceptors. Those neurons um, that are primed to detect noxious stimuli. 
Here we've got the medicinal leech. That's got a segmented body pattern. Each of those segments has cell bodies in it for nerves, some of which are nociceptors. And here we've got the rainbow trout, again, a species which has nociceptors. So all of those outlined in gray here are species where it has been demonstrated that nociceptors are present within that species. So nociceptors are present everywhere where we look for them in species that have nervous systems. But you might be thinking, well, hang on, pain is an unpleasant thing. Do we really need it? Well, we can look at what, goes, what happens to humans where they've lost this ability to detect noxious stimuli. This is an image of a boy with congenital insensitivity to pain. So congenital, it's a genetic condition. Insensitivity to pain does what it says on the tin. He can't feel painful things. So that might sound good, but if we look more closely, you can see that he's got no fingers or thumbs. He's got an ulcerated left knee. He's going to lean on a ladder to support himself. And if you ask him to stick his tongue out, he can't. And the reason for that is he doesn't have one anymore. And you might be thinking, well, why would that be? Well, if you think about when you have a hot drink, if it's too hot, you might spit it out or stop drinking. And you've detected that it's too hot because of nociceptors within your mouth. This person doesn't have any. So they would just be pouring boy hot liquid down into their body and they wouldn't be detecting that it's burning them. Similarly, if you get damage on a finger, you might get a, an infection to it. And with this poor person here, they'll have multiple injuries across time because they're not able to detect things in the same way. And quite often, uh, fingers have to be amputated to prevent further damage occurring. And just to demonstrate how really this is a complete and utter lack of nociception, a lack of pain, a clinical colleague of mine has a patient now in his late 20s with this condition, and his hands are very much all twisted. And the reason for that is when he was a toddler, um, he used to have lots of arguments with his parents, as most toddlers do. And the way he would win the argument was he would break his own fingers because he couldn't feel that it was painful but his parents would most certainly give in when they saw he was breaking his fingers. Obviously, this then caused uh, disability in later life, but it's an absolute inability to feel painful things. So how does this come about? Well, the main cause, but not the only one, is a mutation in a hormone signaling system. The hormone is called nerve growth factor. It makes nerves grow, um, or it's a receptor, something we call track A. And essentially what happens is that sensory nerves that sense noxious stimuli, nociceptors, fail to innovate their targets during development and they just die off. So if this hormone signaling system between NGF and track A isn't working, the nerves just don't know where they're going and they'll die off. So anatomically, this person does not have sensory neurons that enable him to go, ouch. So although a life without pain might seem good, it certainly isn't. So how does it work? Well, back in the 1600s, uh, Jan Bruegel the Elder and Peter Paul Rubens, they painted the five senses as we think of them. Here we've got a lady looking at lots of things. This is the sense of sight. Oops. And then we've got here uh, the uh, sense of hearing. Uh, and you can see she's surrounded by lots of musical instruments. So this enables her to detect um, all sorts of different sounds. Now she's surrounded by lots of things she can eat. So this is the sense of taste. And lastly, she's surrounded by lots of things she can smell. So this is the sense of smell. But if we look more closely, oh, sorry, one more. Uh, this is the sense of touch. So here she's cuddling an infant and she's surrounded by lots of things she can physically interact with. So here we've got those same five senses. But if we look closely, we can see that other things are taking place. So if we zoom in, for example, on smell, she is sitting outside naked we presume on a hot day and her thermoceptors, her neurons detecting warmth, have told her that it's warm enough to not wear clothes. At least that's the idea I'm going with rather than it saying something about uh, the artists who are painting her. If we zoom in on the hearing image, um, we can see here that she is looking towards us while playing a musical instrument. This requires her to know where different bits of the body are across time. And we do this through proprioceptors, sensory nerves that tell us where different bits of our body are in 3D space. Lastly, if we zoom in on the touch image, we can see here um, that she's cuddling the infants, but next to that, there are a load of medical instruments from the 1600s, and these are quite brutal things and will be eliciting a sense of pain, especially because at this time, there were no anesthetics. So how does this work from a biological perspective? Well, this is a, a sort of standard diagram you'd find in a textbook. We've got some skin with some hairs sticking out of it. Uh, here we've got the spinal cord. And what connects a peripheral organ to the spinal cord are sensory nerves. And these sensory nerves have their cell body in something called the dorsal root ganglia. Um, and they send off one axon to the periphery to detect things and one off to the spinal cord to send that message. So if you activate a neuron at this end, 
the message will fly off the spinal cord. It will go to the brain usually, but things are a bit complicated in the spinal cord. We're gonna stick about talking what happens out here. You've got two main sets of nerve fibers. We've got mechanoreceptors that are involved in detecting touch, and these come in different forms. And we've got nociceptors that are primarily involved in detecting painful things. So they are primed to detect stimuli that could cause the body damage. And your skin has a very high density of these because they are important because the skin is your primary organ that will come into contact with the external environment. So it's your first chance to react to something that might damage you. So this is the textbook diagram. Um, this is what it looks like if you are a mouse. So the brain is off the right hand of the screen here. This is the spinal cord. And you can see on both sides, we've got these DRG, just like we have in the cartoon diagram here. And these are set out in a segmented fashion. You can see at the bottom here, we've got some white lines coming out from these DRG to the skin. And it happens in an organized fashion. The body is segmented. And this is true for the entire body but if we look at the head and neck you have something called the trigeminal ganglia that is situated under your brain and these send out nerve fibers to enable you to have sensory perception within your your head so these drg are where the cell bodies are and we have to remember that however a nerve is going to react will depend upon proteins that it's expressing at its terminal and the proteins are made in the cell body. So the cell bodies that are located within the DRG can act as a good model for what happens at the peripheral terminal. And we'll see about why this is important later on when I show you some experimental data. So this is how pain usually works. We've got pain intensity on the y-axis, how loudly you scream, and stimulus intensity on the x-axis. Now clearly not all stimuli cause pain. I'm hoping that most of you are sitting there wearing socks at the moment and your socks are not evoking any painful sensation. And yet if you wiggle your toes, you will feel that you've got a mechanical input from those socks. But at some point, a stimulus will be great enough to cause pain to occur. Greater stimulus, more pain. So that's the normal condition. You don't want all stimuli to cause pain, but you need to have this pain sensation so you can respond accordingly. But after injury, things change. Everything shifts to the left. You get something called allodynia, so stimuli that used to cause no pain now do, and hyperalgesia, stimuli that used to cause some pain now cause a lot more pain. Now this is, again, like pain, a protective thing. Remember, pain is there to prevent you damaging yourself. If you go to pick up a cup of coffee and it's too hot, you'll go ouch and put it down rather than holding on to it and burning your hand. If you've injured part of your body, let's say you've gone running, you fall over and twist your ankle, the ankle will become red and swollen, and it will become hypersensitive, as we can see in this red curve here. That means that you're more likely to look after the damaged part of the body, which is important for its healing. So this, again, is a part of the normal good response within the body. Inflammation is a good thing. The problem is that sometimes it can get out of control and lead to chronic pain, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. So this is what it looks like in a textbook. But the question is, well, what happens to make this blue curve become the red curve? Is it something happening within the brain? Does your head look at your swollen ankle and go, oh, that looks more painful, and then things happen to make it actually be perceived as more painful? Or is it happening at the end of the nociceptor, that neuron detecting the stimuli? Well, there's quite good evidence that, at least to a certain extent, it's going on in the periphery because of what happens to nociceptors. In this experiment here, scientists were recording from nerves going to the cornea of a guinea pig. So that's the outer layer of the eye. And we're looking at the bottom here at what they were doing. We've got time across the x-axis. And then you can see that they were increasing the temperature of a fluid running across the cornea over time. So we get these temperature steps. And then at the top here, this is the first stimulation. They're measuring the electrical impulses, action potentials. They're measuring that nerve being turned on. So at those lower temperatures, nothing happens. Then at a certain temperature, you start to get electrical firing and that increases over time. Then what they did is they poured onto that system chemicals that we know are present at sites of inflammation. So when you have an inflammatory uh, flame part of the body, you get what's called an inflammatory soup full of lots of different chemicals that are known to modulate neuronal function. And we can see that modulation here when they repeat the experiment. We've now got electrical impulses happening at temperatures that used to cause no firing, and we've got greater firing at levels where we used to get some. So we can call this allodynia, i.e. we've now got responses to temperatures that used to cause no sensation, 
And we've had to double the y-axis here to encode this higher level of activity happening within a temperature range that even under control conditions elicited nervous activity. So nociceptor sensitization drives this change in our pain sensation. There are changes happening in the spinal cord and the brain, but the nociceptor itself is that primary input to how pain happens. So if we're going to work on studying pain, uh, and I use rodents in my research, you could think, well, ethically, that's horrific. Why are you doing that? We have painkillers. Um, I need to convince you there is a case for doing pain research. So is there a high prevalence of chronic pain in adults? Well, we can define chronic pain in different ways. Um, we can define it as occurring more than one body part uh, for over three months. So what I'm going to do now is, is I'm going to ask you to answer a poll to see what you think. So what are the answers to this? What is the prevalence of chronic pain in the UK? Is it under 5%, 22%, 43% or 64%? So you can now see that poll if you can fill in your answers, please. Very quick answering going on, this is good to see. So 755 of you present, I'm gonna wait till we get to 700 and then end the poll, just in case some people aren't looking every second. Okay, I'm going to end the poll there and I'll show you the results. So we can see that um, most of you think it's 43%, some 22, some 64. So the question is, are you correct? Well, Yes, you are. 43% is the most common, or if we look across multiple studies, it's been shown that 43% is what comes out. So this is multiple different studies. 43% on average is what is reported as a chronic pain preference. So that's a lot of people. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, hang on, that's, that's not me. Um, that's because most of you are young. Um, if we look at the prevalence of chronic pain in different age groups, most of you are in this age group here, 16 to 34, 18 to 24, you can see it gets a higher prevalence as you get older. So at the young age, we're talking probably around 10%, but once we get up over 75, almost two in three people will experience chronic pain. So just out of interest, uh, another question for you, you got right overall what the prevalence of chronic pain is. What do you think is the most common cause? Is it traumatic injury? So car accident or gunshot wound, herniated disc, this is sort of uh, discs in your spinal cord, migraine, or is it osteoarthritis? Or so arthritis, osteoarthritis. So um, let's launch the next poll and see how you get on. Over to you. Over 500, 600, and I'll end again when we get to 700, almost there. Yeah. Okay. So clearly you should all be being offered places at Cambridge to study medicine. You're, you're right again, it is arthritis, osteoarthritis. So two thirds of you thought that was the case. So just to show you I'm not lying, um, these are data showing about a third of people who experience chronic pain. It's because of arthritis, osteoarthritis. Now, osteoarthritis in particular, age is a major risk factor. We have an aging population. So over time, this is going to become an ever greater burden on that chronic pain population. All right, so there's a high prevalence of chronic pain, but we have painkillers, right? Lots of you have taken ibuprofen or paracetamol. Well, if we go back to those people and say, okay, is your pain medication adequate? to provide pain relief. Not is it perfect, but is it adequate? How many people do you think are happy with their pain relief? So over to you again, what percentage of pain patients feel their medication provides adequate pain relief? Five hundred, six hundred. I'll end again, we get to 700. Okay. Um, yet again, you are correct. So 36%, which is really not very many people. We have 43% of the population experiencing chronic pain, and only a third say their medication is adequate. So this blue bit is the important bit. Two thirds of people are unhappy. This 
This is either because the medication they take doesn't work, so who's going to take a drug that doesn't do anything, or it could be that the medication works against their pain, but the side effects are so bad, they would really, really rather just deal with their pain. So, for example, opioid medications such as coding can cause constipation. Constipation may sound funny, but it can cause its own problems. And if you're suffering from a bowel condition like irritable bowel syndrome with constipation, you don't want to take a painkiller that increases your main clinical condition. So this is a real problem. Unless, of course, like me, you're a pain researcher, because now we've got a wonderful situation. We have lots of people suffering and we have drugs that don't work. So clearly we need more research to understand more about how pain works in order to develop new painkillers. And lastly, this thing about pain being only a sensation. So it's just ouch, this idea of just saying, well, you can just get on with life. It's just a bit of pain. This is not the case. If we look at the impact of pain on people's lives, so in blue, you can no longer do the activity, in beige, you're less able to do it. 50% of people have problems driving a car. Two thirds of people have problems sleeping. And we know that impoverished sleep has a major impact on other health conditions. So pain is not just ouch, it has a major impact on quality of life. So how can we study pain? And then we'll get on to lessons from the mole rat. We've seen this diagram before. I've told you the cell bodies of these nociceptors are located in the DRG. And because that's where the proteins are made that would be trafficked to the end of the nerve that enables it to detect different stimuli, the cell body can act as a good model for what's going on out here. It's difficult to measure what's going out at the ter nerve terminal because the terminal is embedded in skin, in fat, in bone, and so forth. So we can isolate these DRG and culture individual neurons. That's what you can see. Here we've got neurons in a dish, some have put out little neurites. Uh, the problem is these things are small, so we need to look at them under a microscope, and also how we're we going to measure their function. Well, nerves function by sending electrical signals. Very simply put, the nervous system is like an electric switch. You switch it on at the end, an electric signal flies off to the spinal cord. So we use a technique called electrophysiology, and this is the sort of equipment we use. This is the microscope. Um, these machines enable us to amplify the very small currents that we're going to measure from very small cells. We have a little dish here which contains the cells you just short saw. If we zoom in on that, here is our dish with some cells. This is an electrode, the end of which is about half a micrometer. We can put that physically inside the cell, meaning we've got access to its electrical activity. On the left here, we have a perfusion system with a very, very small tip with lots of different solutions running into it. We can then flow over a neuron, a hot solution, a cold solution, an acidic solution, and measure the changes in electrical activity. So before I show you what that looks like, I want to see if you've been paying attention and see if we can get you to get all these questions correct. So you already know the answer to this because I've already shown you the data. But what is the threshold for detection of noxious heat in mammals? So what temperature makes you go ouch? So over to you. Is it 32, 42, 52 or 62 degrees? And again, I'll stop when we get to 700, up over 400. I can tell you from the way the poll is coming in, there's a bit more of a battle here about which temperature is correct or not. Over 600. Almost at 700, very, very close. All right, I'll end it there just so you can win again. So um, you can see that just about most who put 42 degrees, those who put 32 degrees have a bit of a think because the internal body temperature is 37 degrees. Are they healthy? of the human being. So if our pain threshold was at 32, you'd be in constant pain. So 42 degrees may not seem very hot. And the reason I said I've shown you the data already is because that was the temperature that guinea pig nerve fiber started firing. But remember, we want to detect stimuli before there's actual damage occurring. And that's at 42 degrees. 52 degrees, you're already going to get physical damage to the body. So as proof of that, here is a recording from a nerve. We're looking here at the electrical activity, and at this point, we had a 49 degree stimulus, and you get these action potentials. This is the nerve being switched on. We could look at this in a different way. 25 milliseconds on the x axis, very fast time here. We go from room temperature to 49 degrees. Not all nerves change their electrical activity, they're heat insensitive. We have nerves that just function as mechanoreceptors, they don't respond to heat. But some rapidly change their activity when we apply that hot stimulus. If we plot current against temperature, we can detect a threshold of 42 degrees. 
Now, you may be sitting there thinking, well, going, well, this is silly. Look, you've taken a nerve out of an animal, put it in a dish, put an electrode in it, and you're trying to convince you that 42 degrees is important. Well, we can do experiments in humans without having to kill them and take out their DRG neurons because humans can speak. We can do experiments like shown here. You have a piece of equipment that controls the temperature. You put a thermode on the arm and you ask people to say when it's warm, when it's cold, when it's painfully hot. On the left here, we've got a healthy group of human beings. And again, it's 42-ish degrees. There is some natural spread, but that is our average temperature. On the right is a group of women who did not request analgesia during childbirth, which was a study we've published recently. We were looking for genetic variants in pain, and we were able to identify one particular gene shown by these red triangle ladies, where they had a higher pain threshold. So there are genetic variations that control heat sensitivity, but in healthy human beings, it's about 42 degrees. So studying neurons in a dish from a rodent does provide a good model of certain aspects of pain sensation in humans. And the data I showed you on the previous slide was those experiments were carried out in 1996. In 1997, the protein responsible for that heat sensation was identified. In 2000, mice were, identi were, were ge uh, genetically engineered to lack that protein. They had a certain phenotype, so their behavior changed to certain stimuli. And there are now drugs in clinical trials targeting that one protein to try and be used in pain relief. So it takes a long time to go from basic research through to the clinic, but there is a definite need for this, as we've already seen from the number of people in chronic pain and the problems we have with uh, people having adequate pain relief. So on to the final part of my talk, which will take us up to about quarter past 11, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions um, before the next session starts. So this is a naked mole rat um, sitting on the palm of my hand. They're basically large mice rather than small rats. They're about the size of a, a mouse. So these are subterranean rodents living in Ethiopia, Kenya, and Somalia. These are warm places in East Africa. They're eusocial. That means you have a colony of animals where the queen is the only breeding female. This is a very unusual system in mammals. Usually as a mammal, you hit the age of sexual reproduction, you'll leave the family and go off and generate your own offspring because evolution is all about passing on your genes. We see this in insects, but not in mammals. So this is unusual. They're also cold-blooded, poikilothermic. You can see a body temperature against ambient temperature. This is as perfect a correlation as a biologist will ever see. They're unable to thermoregulate. They can't shiver, they can't sweat. And this is probably an adaptation to their environment. Underground in these countries, um, the difference in temperature between summer and winter, day and night is about two degrees. So if there's no evolutionary pressure to thermoregulate, you lose it. And that's what the naked mole rat has done. So that means we have to look after them under special conditions in the lab to make sure they don't get too cold or too hot. We have to keep them in a room about 30 degrees, their happy temperature but it does introduce certain problems. So when I started here in Cambridge, we had no naked mole rats and I imported them from a colleague of mine in the US. The animals are going from Texas to Miami, Miami to Heathrow, Heathrow to Cambridge. And I got an email telling me that my mole rats had missed their connecting flight in Miami, which seems funny. All these mole rats running around the air airport with their little carry-on bags um, until you realize that all the time that they're not traveling as quickly as they should be, they're going to be getting cold. So when the animals arrived in Cambridge, there was a lot of interest. We hadn't had these animals here before. There were the vets, the animal technicians. We opened up the box and it looked like I'd paid a lot of money for some very dead animals. But all was OK. They were just a little cold. If your core body temperature was down about 20 degrees, you also wouldn't be moving very much. So put the animals back in the incubator. They warmed up. Nobody died in transit. It was all OK. But it's something we need to bear in mind. In the wild, mole rats live like this. They form tunnels, they have a nest, they dig the tunnels with their teeth. Um, it's thought they've evolved these large eusocial uh, colonies because going back before agricultural farming, there wasn't a lot of food. So you've got two choices as an animal. You try and find it on your own. If you do, hurrah, if you don't, you're dead. That's risky. If you work with your family members and you share the food, you're more likely to find it and survive. If you're going to dig through the soil with your teeth, you need good teeth and this is a CT scan through a naked mole rat skull, and you can see those teeth are pretty damn impressive. They go right up into the top and bottom of the skull. So before we look at how the mole rats can tell us about pain, I want to show you a couple of videos showing us, showing you how we look after the naked mole rats. So these are the mole rats sitting in Cambridge. They're in a room at 30 degrees. There's a heat cable here that runs under certain cages because the animals can detect changes in temperature. They just can't internally do anything about it, but they will huddle together as you'll see later on to conserve heat. So you can see them running about with bits of food. What's this one struggling with? 
It's a green bean. They've never worked out if they hold the bean the other way, it would fit through the tunnel. Uh, this one is running around with some bedding, uh, but much like humans sharing a bed, this one disagrees about where that bedding should be. And this is saying hello in mole rats. They're not being too aggressive with each other. This is sweet potato, the main substance we give them to mimic the sort of food that they would get in the wild. And you can see that this particular mole rat has a particular fancy for sweet potato. He's already got all these bits and now he wants that bit. Uh, but this one also wants that bit of sweet potato. And you can see how wide they can open their mouths. Everything if you're a mole rat is about opening your mouth and biting. So after a bit of tug and war, uh, looks like the one on the left wins, but the time lapse shows us that no, the guy on the right wins. We don't know what he's doing with the sweet potato, but he has it all. This is called volcanoing, where the animals kick up bedding. Um, that's how they kick the soil out when they're uh, forming a chain of animals to form tunnels. This yellow stuff is a South African breakfast cereal called Pronutro, which is full of vitamins and avoids the animals uh, getting their skin drying out. There is a scientific paper on which moisturizer to use on your mole rats. I have 150 animals. I haven't got time every day to moisturize my mole rats. So is this animal dead? No, probably just having a dream. Uh, much like humans, mole rats tend to sleep in very odd positions, not like mice where every mouse looks identical. So if you're a mole rat and you want to show dominance, you will go on top when you meet another animal. The queen will always go on top. Um, but if you're just running around, it doesn't really matter. But if you're trying to show dominance, you will assert it by going on top and pushing the other animal back. You can see this animal running backwards. They run backwards as quickly as they can forwards. Their main predator is a snake. We give them things to run on. They love running, but they're a bit too big. No one makes mole rat sized toys. Most of you might be under 18, look away. This is the queen doing what a queen has to do to keep a colony going once a quarter. So this animal hasn't died, he's coming in for a sleep. They've chosen a very small cage with a heat cable underneath it. Remember, they can't thermoregulate, but they can conserve heat by huddling all together to sleep. And that's what's going on here. So they're having a good sleep, um, all lying in rather odd positions. You can see this one chewing on this one's neck. What's all that about? Well, maybe it's a tickle in mole rat because he's just yawning through it. So I've told you the queen gives birth about once a quarter. Um, this next video is my favorite video of any mole rat. This is not a dead animal. This is a very heavily pregnant queen mole rat. And she's going to try and get up from her sleep. It's a bit of a struggle, as you can see. Look at the size of the other animals next to her compared to how massively round she has become. As she rolled there, you may have seen her teats because she's right on the verge of pregnancy. And she really struggles to get round and show physical dominance uh, when she's this heavily pregnant. But if things go to plan, you end up with lots of little babies. So you'll see some babies in this video here. Uh, mole rat nests look rather chaotic, but believe it or not, the other animals are actually looking after the babies. Um, it's always a bit of a, a, a problematic thing showing this because it doesn't really look like they're being looked after. They're sort of being bundled around all over the place. But mole rats are a loving species. All right. So why do we want to study naked mole rats? Well, they live for over 30 years. This graph shows maximal li uh, lifespan in years on the y-axis against body mass on the x-axis. Broadly speaking, uh, the bigger you are, uh, the longer you live. So HS, Homo sapiens, that's us. We live for longer than we should. HS is heterocephalus glaber, the naked mole rat. They live for longer than they should. So heterocephalus glaber, hetero different cephalus head, glaber bald. When these were first identified in the wild, the person named them different headed bald things, which seems fair enough. The longest living animal ever known is this one in my hands. At the time this photo was taken, I was 38, I've got gray hair, this animal's 37 and looks perfectly okay. So we age, the mole rat doesn't. But what can we learn about pain? Well, I'm going to give you one example. Acid causes pain. Your body is normally at pH 7.4. Lots of you are interested in applying to study medicine. Uh, medical students are idiots. Now I'm saying that in the nicest possible way. That's because they volunteer for things. So this particular study is medical students who volunteered to have acid injected into them. They are volunteered to be hurt. So they have a needle that goes in their arm. If you inject a pH 7.4, a neutral solution, there is some pain because you've got a mechanical force going into the arm. But as we lower the pH, it becomes ever more painful. Why is this important? Well, we're not talking about giving lemon juice into cut skin. Um, acid, acidosis can occur in different uh, circumstances. If you've got inflammation, certain white blood cells release lactic acid. Um, you also get acidosis occurring in tumorous cancer. Where you've got a big lump of tissue. So acid causes pain. Tissue acidosis occurs in painful conditions. 
What about naked mole rats? Well, we're comparing mole rats and mice. Here we're looking at their response to a mechanical stimulus and a heat stimulus. Latency is the time it takes the animal to respond. Mice and mole rats take as long to go ouch as each other. And these are similar tests to those we do in humans. They're conducted in a different way, but there's no lifelong damage. You get a short stimulus, you remove the stimulus, and nothing happens. If we look at chemicals, if you get acid into your skin, you'll rub yourself better. If you bang your knee against a table leg, mice will lick their paw. Capsaicin is the substance that makes chili peppers taste hot. Mice lick their paw, mole rats don't care. I haven't got time to tell you about that. Acid, like the human, where acid causes pain, mice will lick their paw, mole rats don't. So if we can understand how mole rats don't feel acid as a painful stimulus, will that tell us about how we sense acid as being painful and identify potentially new therapeutic targets for treating those conditions associated with tissue acidosis? From the mole rat's point of view, it's probably evolved this ability because it lives underground with lots of animals. That means you're generating lots of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide mixed with water produces carbonic acid, which dissociates to produce protons, acid. So they're living in a relatively safe environment, but it's one where there's a lot of carbon dioxide. So if they want to stay safe, but not feel acid pain, they have to adapt to that acid stimulus. And that's what they've done. Acid doesn't cause pain. Now you may be sitting there going, well, hang on, who cares? This is a mole rat, you're comparing it to a mouse. If you happen to know, mice, um, from an evolutionary point of view, come from Asia, mole rats from Africa. What kind of comparison is this? Well, we can go back and look at different species. This is the same data I showed you earlier on, showing our evolution of pain. All those species in red have been shown to have acid nociception. Here is H. sapiens, that's us. The mole rat is unusual. Even C. elegans, with those 302 neurons, to detect acid as being noxious. Medicinal leech detects acid as being noxious. The rainbow trout detects acid as being noxious. So acid sensitivity is common. The naked mole rat is the weird one. So what's going on? Well, we can look at the end of that nerve as having to do two things. We have to have proteins that act as sensors of the acid, and then we've got to have voltage sensors which send that message. So if, if any of you have been to the dentist and had something nasty done, they'll have injected you with a local anesthetic. What that does is it blocks the voltage sensors. So it doesn't matter what stimulus happens. It doesn't matter if the dentist uh, cuts your gum, drills a nerve, burns out a nerve. It doesn't matter what the stimulus is. The signal cannot pass. So that's roughly how the nerves work. You have a, a protein that detects something, proteins that send that signal. So we have those protons come along, signal fires, and off it goes. So one hypothesis would be that naked mole rats just don't have these acid sensors. So we can go back to our DRG neurons, we can use that electrophysiology technique and see if they respond to acid. And indeed they do. We apply acid, we get a big electrical response. And I'm not showing you here, but it's basically the same sort of response as you get in mice. So, no, naked mole rat nociceptors do not just lack proton sensors. This is not surprising because there are an awful lot of them. From an evolutionary point of view, to switch off multiple systems is complicated. You need something simpler. So another option could be that the mole rats have evolved a different way, such that the voltage sensors get turned off by acid. So that local anesthetic you get at the dentist is a non-selective compound. There are nine of these voltage sensors within the human body, within the mammalian system but some of them are only present in nociceptors. So it could be the mole rat has adapted such that one of these voltage sensors is switched off by acid. So it doesn't matter if you activate the nerve, the signal won't travel. And indeed, that's what we see. In an electrical physiology experiment, we can activate these voltage sensors, and we're looking at the amount of current that passes through them. If we then apply acid, it gets smaller. And what we've got over here is a comparison looking at the amount of inhibition by acid in the mouse versus the naked mole rat. We have much greater inhibition of these voltage sensors in the naked mole rat than in the mouse. We conducted genetic analysis and identified one voltage sensor that had changed. And that means that acid acts like an anesthetic rather than an, um, an activator of neurons in the naked mole rat. So in cartoon formats, the mouse, our model of, of humans, Acid causes pain, it's got acid sensors, and the voltage sensors, although they're blocked by acid, the balance is tipped so that the nociceptor fires. In naked mole rats, it's the other way around. They've got all the normal acid sensors, but the voltage sensors have been changed through evolution in such a way that acid switches them off and you don't generate that noxious stimulus being um, passed through the system. 
So hopefully I've convinced you that detecting noxious stimuli is vital for your survival. We saw that boy who couldn't feel painful stimuli. To do this, you have dedicated nerves, nociceptors, which detect noxious stimuli. Remember, this is a good thing. We need to detect our environment. But chronic pain is when that system has gone wrong. It's common and the current medications are inadequate. Acidosis is common to inflammation and acid causes pain, unless you're a naked mole rat. So we were able to identify a mutated voltage sensor, which was key to this acid insensitivity. It that put it up there as a new therapeutic target in treating inflammatory pain. At a similar time, mutations in the same voltage sensor were found in humans that accounted for different pain sensitivities. So from different angles, this one particular voltage sensor is now a very keen pain target, and there are clinical trials currently in progress looking at targeting it. So I'm going to stop there. Um, hopefully you found that interesting, and I'll happily look at questions in the Q&A. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen. And there are questions that have gone into the chat and there are questions that have gone into the Q&A. So I realize the next session starts at 11.30. So I'm going to go through the Q&A and look at questions um, until we hit 25 past 11. So if you want to stay and follow the questions, that's fine. If you don't want to, then don't worry. So uh, how many students are watching this? There are currently 762 of you. Why do we seemingly instinctively cover our ears when we hear loud sounds? Um, that's an interesting one. So nociception and hearing versus just something that might cause you damage. Um, we don't really understand. There are very few people who study the nociception of hearing. Um, but broadly speaking, if something is above a certain decibel range, it will be painful. And your instant reaction to that is to stop the sound waves getting into your ears. And so you block your ears. Um, and basically you need to do that because the loud sounds will eventually wipe out your hair cells, which detect the vibrations that enable you to hear things. So um, someone asked what DRG stood for. It stood for dorsal root ganglia. Sorry for not making that clear. So the next question, would the painkillers be affecting all the nociceptors in the body since they detect the pain? Wouldn't it be dangerous? Does all the pain get blocked by painkillers? Well, not all painkillers are equal. Um, so if we take something like ibuprofen, this is what we call a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, which is a rather complicated name for basically saying it prevents inflammation happening. So what it does is it prevents cells producing certain chemicals that sensitize nociceptors. So that means it causes that change in sensitivity we saw. So they can be effective only in a system where you're producing these pro-inflammatory mediators. So they will affect, for example, if you've got a twist, ankle and it's all red and swollen, in that part of the body, you will now have an up-regulated level of these chemicals. And so that will get switched off and that will help normalize your pain. But those drugs aren't working on the nerve. They're preventing these chemicals from acting on the nociceptor. By contrast, other painkillers such as morphine, they act directly on nerves, but they don't just act on nociceptors. They act both on the peripheral and the central nervous system. So therefore, it's impossible for me to answer that in a short way of doing things here. There are a variety of painkillers that act in different ways. In terms of is it dangerous? Yes. Local anesthetic at the dentist is great because you switch off pain in a localized area for a short amount of time. If someone lives with chronic pain, you don't want to just flood their system with the local anesthetic because you can't then feel anything. And then you've got the risk of damaging yourself. So you might end up like that boy with a congenital insensitivity to pain. So what we always want to do with painkillers is normalize pain. We don't want to switch it off completely because we've seen what's gone wrong. How did we manage to get things past ethic boards? So all animal experimentation is controlled by the Home Office. I have a Home Office project license, which is valid for five years. This is a process by which uh, I have to say, these are the things I want to do and why I think I need to do them. This is exactly what will happen to each animal. These are the adverse effects that I expect to see. And these are the number of animals I require in order to make statistically relevant findings. I submit this to a vet, animal technicians, and they provide feedback. I then modify my license. It then goes to an animal welfare ethical review body, which is made up of um, GPs, vets, other scientists, and I have to defend what I want to do. Only at that point, once I've made all those amendments, taken everything on board, does it go to the Home Office for approval. And that Home Office approval is from a Home Office inspector who is a qualified vet. 
they can reject everything I want to do. It's in the hands of the Home Office. Once I've got my project license, every individual working in my lab has to take their own courses to get their personal license to work with animals. This is training courses on animal welfare, the legal side of things, and how to do each individual procedure has its own training log. So you cannot just say, I want to do experiments on animals and go ahead and do it. On top of that, every institute's running animal experiments has to have an establishment license enabling them to have the facilities to provide animal research to happen. So that means having vets, having the right caging facilities, all sorts of things. For the human ethics, it's a bit different, but it all essentially goes to the NHS and lay bodies and things get approved that way. Uh, just to point out, by the way, there are over 100 questions and I've got six minutes to go. So I'm not possibly going to answer any of these, um, but you will have seen my email address. So you can happily ping me emails to ask things afterwards if you want to. Um, so I'm just scrolling through to see if I can find some broader um, questions. Um, for the study about measuring genetic factors affecting pain, why were women only chosen for this study? So I showed you this heat pain sensitivity where we were looking at um, whether people's sensitivity was changed. And these women were identified because we had been looking at childbirth. We were trying to find variants in pain and want to look at something natural. So giving birth to a child is painful. The majority of women will request analgesics. So what we did is we just put out to lots of clinics across the UK, asking them to report from patients who did not request analgesia. So that's why it was only women. Um, we didn't just, there are very different reasons why someone might not want to take analgesics, um, but there were lots of surveys then done to work out which ones we needed to study before we looked at the genetics. So the reason that was only women was because we used childbirth as our starting point. Okay, what is the most exciting thing I've learned from the naked mole rat? Um, if you don't have oxygen, you die very quickly. When someone has a stroke, there's a blood clot to the brain, Oxygen, therefore, is not delivered. Bits of the brain start dying. And that is why you end up in a situation of someone having a disability, because that part of the brain is permanently damaged. If you put a mouse into 0% oxygen, it will die within about 40, 50 seconds. We would be the same. Naked mole rats can go for almost 20 minutes with no oxygen, with no problem whatsoever. Their brain can cope without oxygen, which to me is incredible, because for people like my mum, who had a stroke, who's got permanent brain damage, there's nothing we can do. If we can understand how the mole rat survives this period without oxygen to generate energy, to keep the brain going, to keep the heart going, um, that would be a huge breakthrough. Because essentially for decades, we've been studying um, how stroke damage happens in mice and rats, which are as bad as we are at dealing with a lack of oxygen. Whereas the mole rat is this extreme animal that is still a mammal. So if we can identify the differences, hopefully we can translate that to humans. What is analgesia? Sorry for not being clearer. So analgesia is just a technical term for pain relief. So you can call a, a drug that causes a pain relief, a, a painkiller, or you can call it an analgesic. Okay, so scrolling through the questions. Um, is disease spread easily between naked mole rats in the wild? Um, we don't really know. Naked mole rats are very xenophobic, so they tend not to mix within colonies. Um, they do have a very unusual immune system, which is just beginning to be studied. Um, it appears they're quite susceptible to viral infections. Uh, and interesting, of course, with COVID at the moment, there's a paper many years ago looking at coronavirus infections in mole rats. This isn't people deliberately infecting them. This is where there was an outbreak in a, in a, in a, a zoo just because uh, another species happened to bring one in and it just got passed around. And naked mole rats are very susceptible to coronavirus, uh, not SARS-CoV-2 we're currently dealing with, but of that family. So we will not be using them for um, uh, for COVID research. Are there any plans put in place to create more adequate medication for those with chronic pain? Yes, this is the be all and end all of my life and everyone in my lab's life, because we don't just study things because we're interesting, or they're interesting, we do, that's obviously something that's there. But fundamentally, we want to make breakthroughs to patients' quality of life. And it's clear when you look at the data on chronic pain, we have an inadequate situation. So we need better pain relief. Um, just yesterday, I was part of a panel where we were applying to the Medical Research Council for funding to look at visceral pain. So this is a huge group of clinicians and basic scientists looking at conditions such as uh, bladder pain, inflammatory bowel disease, lung pain, a broad variety of chronic pain, visceral pain syndromes. And the whole point of this is to understand more about it so that we can hopefully then produce better pain relief for humans, because that's what it's all about. And also I should point out, it's not just humans, it's also non-human animals. A lot of the painkillers that are used for treating humans work perfectly well in animals. And something I should also point out, going back to that ethics question earlier on, is you may be thinking, well, you know, what's gonna come out of this? The best-selling drug in the world last year was a drug called Humira. 
This is a drug that targets a chemical called tumor necrosis factor alpha. This chemical is upregulated in people with rheumatoid arthritis. So by targeting this chemical, you can modify the disease and transform someone's life. The only reason that Humira, this drug, ever came about is because of work on mice in the 1990s demonstrating the importance of TNF-alpha in driving rheumatoid arthritis. So that was the starting point that then led to breakthrough therapies. So you can go from mice to humans. Things take time. Um, okay. I'm scrolling. For, I'll answer a couple more questions and I'll have a bit of a break. Um, so what is the evolutionary advantage of the mole rat not being able to detect the acid stimulus? So hopefully I pointed this out. The animals live underground in large colonies where they're breathing without much fresh air. Therefore, you get raised carbon dioxide levels. Carbon dioxide mixes with water to produce acid, which would then for most of us cause pain. If you look at one of those carbon dioxide fire extinguishers, if you blast that into your face, not saying you should, but if you did, the carbon dioxide will mix with the water and cause activation of nociceptors and pain. The animals are living in a relatively safe environment underground. They don't really have many predators. So if they want to stay in that safe environment, they've had to adapt so that acid no longer causes pain. Okay, I'm gonna answer one more question. As I say, I don't know how many there are, it just says, tells me there's 99 plus, and that's in the chat, or oh, that's in the Q&A, and I can see there's an awful lot more in the chat. So please do feel free if you really want to, uh, to email me um, uh, questions afterwards. So last question, what should we go for? Um, da, da, da. One more. Uh, so I'm trying to pick the best last question. Is it true that naked mole rats are resistant to cancers? No. Um, the problem with science online is that sometimes people make a good headline for a good story, but don't actually look at the data. So there are papers out, or there are scientific journal, not as in peer reviewed scientific papers. There are things like the Daily Mail or New Scientist that will use headlines they shouldn't. So it will say naked mole rats are immune from pain. No, they're not. I showed you they've got mechanical and heat pain, just like a mouse and a human, but they're resistant to certain chemicals. And it's the same with cancer. Naked mole rats are highly, highly resistant to cancer. Uh, the lifetime chance for human getting cancer is about one in two. Um, for mice and rats, it's about one in two. Um, for certain dog species, it's also about one in two. For naked mole rats, it's well under 0.001%. There are a few documented cases, but they're highly resistant. So again, we've got projects going on in the lab to try and identify why is it the mole rat is resistant to cancer. If we can work out what that is, we might be able to translate that to humans. If, for example, the mole rats just have this immune cell in their body that's releasing a certain chemical which just finds and kills off cancerous cells to prevent them spreading, that could be something we could translate across uh, to humans. Um, so I'm going to almost stop there, but I've seen one last question, which is, do I have a favorite naked mole rat? Yes, I do. My first ever queen here is called Cruella. She's really evil and nasty because she has to stay in charge of her colony. And so I'm, I'm always very proud of her whenever she looks after her next litter of uh, babies. I didn't give her the name, the technicians did. All right, I hope you enjoyed that.